tihe moriora, ena mana, ena reo, ena karangatanga maha, tena koto. Ea kurangatira, kia tato e tone kanui takumihi. Tohuti mai kita tato hui fakanui. Kanui te honore kita mi kia koto, no rera, tena koto, tena koto, tena tato katoa. A very warm welcome to everyone to the inaugural lecture of Averil Coxhead, Professor in Applied Linguistics in the School of Linguistics and Applied Language Studies. I'm Jennifer Windsor, Acting Vice-Chancellor of Te Heringawaka, Victoria University of Wellington. It's my great pleasure to see everyone here this evening, uh, including Averil's family, um, students, guests from the community, academic and professional staff colleagues, students, and other colleagues, including from the senior leadership team. Professor Coxhead is an expert in applied linguistics with international renown for guiding both academic and trades-based lexical and grammatical teaching and learning in New Zealand and many other countries. Averill has held academic appointments both here and at Massey University. She was named professor in 2020. I think it's fair to say that when you spend any time with Averill, you're immediately struck by her supportive, optimistic, humble, humorous, often informal scholarly style, as well as struck by her respect for her academic mentors and colleagues, all of which attributes make her a fabulous university citizen, as does her superb teaching, postgraduate supervision, and leadership of university-wide projects. And so it can sometimes be easy to forget that when you are talking with Averill, you are also talking with the scholar who has written the books and the articles, some of the most influential publications in her field on vocabulary and vocabulary instruction. Fairly early in her career, Averill developed a theoretical word taxonomy to support tertiary level learning of academic English, including um, academic English as learned by non-native speakers. It's the academic word list. Now, academic language is highly technical, and to succeed at higher levels of education, you need to have a strong core vocabulary of common words in academic texts. And that's what the academic word list does. Averill is the person who, with colleagues through many years now of very careful and precise theoretical and practical work with corpora of millions of words, has helped move language teaching and word lists to new educational ground. While her work was initially mainly carried out in English, it now incorporates languages such as Danish, Tongan, and Chinese. She's expanded her work on academic vocabulary to the equally highly technical trades-based language. Now, her work is both, I think, prolific and programmatic, and it's foundational to the nature of vocabulary instruction, textbooks, dictionaries, learning materials, and research in English for academic purposes and English for specific purposes worldwide. It is arguably the dominant work of its kind. And her work with colleagues on language and trades education has also become a pivotal form of engagement and practice with New Zealand's vocational and trades community. The impacts of her work can also be seen in our schools. The language and the trades education or LATTE project, for example, has informed New Zealand curriculum initiatives. Tonight, Avril will discuss her collaborations on vocabulary for specific purposes in new contexts and in languages other than English. In the invitation to her inaugural, Averill mentions a line of poetry from Alan Kurnow to describe how moving in new research directions can result in surprising gains. She quoted, simply by sailing in a new direction, you could enlarge the world. I'd add the second line of that poem. You picked your captain, keen on discoveries, tough enough to make them. Sums up Ave's contributions very well. It is my great pleasure to welcome Captain and Professor <laughs> Averil Coxhead to the podium. Kia ora rawatu.
First of all, thank you so much for that invitation and welcome. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my family. There are many of us in the audience. Coxie family members say whoop. <laughs> a fair number of us. <laughs> so um, I'm Averill, or as my brother Vern always says, this is Averill. She's never left school. <laughs> and, and, and here I am still at school, so he's absolutely right. Don't ever tell him that, even though he knows. So I'm um, Vice-Chancellor, members of the um, SLT council members' family, at my students and my friends. Thank you so much for coming along to su support me today. It means a lot. So I'm going to be talking about moving in other directions and going outside comfort zones. So I've organised my talk. There are two parts. Good, we've done that. <laughs> and we've introduced Alan Kuno. He's, he's somebody that I think this, this line has made me think about who I am and the, and the directions that I want to go in, and I'm going to talk a bit about that tonight. I need to acknowledge Paul Nation, who I can't see. Hey, Paul. Good to see you, and John Reed as well. Thank you. So you can see that uh, Paul and I hold each other in high levels of esteem, uh, that we, we don't get along particularly well. Um, but I'd really like to say thanks, Sport, for all of your work. And thanks for being here tonight. It means a lot to me. So I'm an applied linguist. And what do applied linguists do apart from go to conferences in Japan? And you can probably spot me in that picture kissing the sumo wrestler. Anyway, so what do we do, <laughs> applied linguists? So we work on real life problems that are caused by language. And in my uh, case, this means vocabulary studies, for example, in English for academic purposes and English for specific purposes. And I'll talk more about these things soon. Most of the time when people say, what do you do? I say, I'm a teacher. Because A, that's what makes the most sense. And uh, B, if I say I'm an applied linguist, they want to know how many languages do I speak? I'll leave that one up to you. <laughs> and thank you to Jonathan Newton for tracking down that particular cartoon for me. So when I think about comfort zones, what do I mean? Well, actually, comfort zones probably aren't the right term because research isn't a particularly comfortable place to be, I've found, in the years that I've been doing it. So what I'm going to talk about first is the real-life problems caused by language that have been the focus of my research in the last few years. So the, I started as English, teaching English for academic purposes here at Victoria University of Wellington. And one of the main things that was the concern for me when I first started in that area was what is academic English and how do I help my students the best that I possibly can. I came across this quote by Maxwell in 2013 that reminded me that we're not born speaking academic English. This is something that you, you grow with and you learn. And hopefully you learn to use it as much as possible. So in my MA thesis, I have to say, Paul was giving me feedback on my writing and said that he thought perhaps I could use a bit more of my academic vocabulary list in my own academic writing. So <laughs> point well taken. Thanks for that, Paul. So one of the main concerns to start with was what vocabulary do learners need for university studies? And I started with looking at general written academic English, and that was going around, knocking on doors around the university saying, what do you give students to read? And the, sometimes the professors would say, uh, you need to go and talk to my secretary. Can you imagine that? Go and talk to my secretary. OK. So I was collecting texts from all over the university. And what I was looking for was the vocabulary that occurred across subject areas. So it didn't matter if you were studying biology or linguistics or history or something to do with business. I wanted to know what was the vocabulary everybody had in common. And the reason for that is I never knew where my students would end up. And many students start in one subject area and move, right? So I wanted to, be, to do the most useful work that I possibly could. And then that work extended to looking at the vocabulary of the sciences. And again, doesn't matter where you start, what language is shared across the sciences. I then turned in my PhD research to look at using vocabulary in writing because this is something that I often heard teachers say, you know, I teach people these words and they never use them in their writing. So I wanted to find out what was happening there. And I'd like to thank Maria, who was listening to me one day saying, you know, this is, these are the efforts that people are making in order to avoid using words that they're not very sure about or they're trying to express concepts and they haven't quite got it. And she said, oh, it's like tennis. It's like running around my backhand. So that's my weakness. So what do I do to make my writing stronger? I then uh, need to say that this research has gone wider. It's gone to Denmark of all places. 
And uh, Anne Sophie Jakobsen, who's the tallest person in the picture, is, uh, she came to New Zealand. She's been doing work on academic written Danish, and she was particularly interested in the vocabulary, which is high frequency. So the words that occur very often in English but have an academic memory, uh, academic meaning as well. I've also recently looked with uh, we, a couple of lockdown MA students. It's not that I locked them down, but the, you know we were locked down. <laughs> And we looked at Indonesian English as a foreign language textbooks and Chinese English as a foreign language textbooks to say teachers are using these textbooks to prepare, university stu prepare students for university studies. Are they any good for that purpose? And the answer was no. Anyway, carry on. <laughs> so word lists, Jennifer's mentioned word lists and some of the work that I've done. And I've developed quite a few, I have to say, more than I ever thought. So the academic word list was the starting point. We now have the academic spoken word list. One of my PhD colleagues, a PhD student, Ian Dang, uh, developed the academic spoken word list. What we've been doing with these lists is then investigating different kinds of texts. For example, uh, what's the nature of the vocabulary in different subject areas? Uh, and just recently we finished a project on looking at the vocabulary of tutorials and laboratory sessions. So what we wanted to do was to look at the talk that was happening, not the text, but what was happening with the talk. And we ended up doing a fairly large-scale study that got a bit complicated, but what we did was started with a corpus or a body of text and looked at the vocabulary there and the multi-word units there, and then we went to the textbooks that people were using to prepare people for these academic spoken uh, events and found that there was not much connected between those things. So again, we found that the textbooks didn't do, really do a very good job. So part of my work is to try and inform textbook development, textbook writing to try and help. Uh, you might be surprised to find out that one of the textbooks suggested that blah, blah, blah was a really useful academic <laughs> um, phrase that people should use and probably actually write. And another one was, you're kidding. Can you imagine somebody saying that to you in a letter? Um, anyway. So we, we had fun with the research. And then other work on multi-word units, so not just single words, but uh, multi-word units like on the basis of or on the other hand, for example. So trying to look wider at wider groups of words or word strings. What we found in that research is that you have to kiss a lot of frogs before you find a handsome prince. So you have to work really hard to find these items occurring again and again in text, which means it's difficult because you can't say that they occur very often. So learners aren't seeing them very often. It makes it hard. Now, most recently we've been looking at uh, academic collocations such as wide-ranging and trying to work out how we can evaluate lists of multi-word units, which is a bit technical, but what we're saying is if you make a word list, how do you find out if it's any bloody good? And we're following Paul Nation's framework for that. So I started off with university students, and I remember thinking the thing about today's university students is that they are yesterday's secondary school students. So I then moved the research into the secondary school context because you can't complain about people if you don't know where they've come from. So this research, again looking at textbooks and, uh, that are used in schools and then uh, English literature, so things like the plays and the movies and the, the literature that people read in New Zealand secondary schools. The most interesting thing about that research to start with was I thought, well, I know some teachers, but I don't want to worry them. I'll phone the librarians. So I called around a couple of librarians in New Zealand secondary schools and I said, what does everybody read? What do they listen to? And to a person, they said, actually, we're not very sure. When you find out, can you tell us, please? And I was like, okay, all right, I can do that. It's not the answer you expect from a librarian, is it? Okay. And then moved on to look at growth of academic vocabulary knowledge in New Zealand secondary schools. And this was a larger scale Ministry of Education project. The exciting thing for me is that the students who had done primary, gone through the primary school system in, uh, in Te Reo Māori, they were the ones at... Uh, in the English medium secondary schools who made the most progress of learning academic vocabulary. They were just amazing. They just sang. And same with Pacifica speakers of English as well. So they were streets ahead of other people. This project has now gone into Norwegian secondary schools, for example. So again, looking at the growth of knowledge of academic vocabulary because we're not, nobody's a native speaker of this. We all have to learn it. I've also worked on an international school project in Germany. International schools, the people who are in your class today are not the people in the class tomorrow. People get posted in different places. Kids appear and disappear in different, <laughs> in different ways. Not nasty, mean ways, but, you know, they might not be there tomorrow. They might come from all over the world. So um, in this research, we were looking at the, the vocabulary that um, students 
um, here when they're in the classroom. So what are their teachers talking about across three subject areas? Again, the sciences are off the charts in terms of the language that gets used. It's much more difficult than other subject areas. And then looking to see how vocabulary knowledge grows and then looking again at textbooks in that space. So really just trying to find out much more about what happens in schools. And then finally, here's Jennifer Green, my co-author um, of a book on subject-specific vocabulary. So that's saying if students are coming in to do uh, into the maths classroom and then going into a science classroom and then studying health, what's the vocabulary they need in all of those subject areas? So that work um, has really looked, if you know much about the American textbook system, it's, it's a huge area of research and they follow two, uh, the, t the Texan or the Californian model. So this kind of work really tries to feed back into textbooks and textbook development. And if you've ever been to Seattle, you might recognize Chihuly Glass, which is something we also visited when maybe we should have been at a conference in the afternoon. <laughs> so I moved from, from secondary schools. I'm still interested in that, but I've also been looking more recently at vocabulary for specific purposes because I'm trying to move from within, just within the university context, that's enormously important, but there are many more people out there doing different kinds of learning. So vocabulary for specific purposes, for example, one of my PhD candidates was um, studying traditional Chinese medicine and you might be concerned, for example, if you needed to find out about your rebellious liver chi. Um, so some of the things we found out about this research is that, you, as you can see, you have words in English co-occurring with words in Chinese. You've got a lot of technical medical vocabulary, and there is a lot to learn about what damp heat might mean, for example. So you, you, people have to develop this kind of knowledge. And we've also been looking at how learners understand and develop that vocabulary knowledge themselves. So the, the main hypothesis was that if you were a Chinese learner versus a non-Chinese speaking learner, you might have an advantage. No. As people develop their vocabulary, as, the, as they develop their specialised knowledge of the area, they develop their academic language and their specialised language. And this is something Paul talked about years ago, and I remember going, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't get it until we did that work. We've just recently been doing some work on rugby, and this is Stuart Benson's work. So the thing about rugby that's really interesting is that it's, you learn it through speaking. You don't learn it through reading things. And when you're learning about speaking, you're actually playing a game at the same time. It's reasonably dangerous. You need to know what you're doing. And you need to understand what people are saying as much as you need to be able to communicate what it is that you're going to be doing as well. Now, I've learned about Fat Man's Alley from Maria's family. We didn't find any evidence in the corpus for that, but it is the best term ever. Okay, and a little bit more. Jenny Drayton, you're in the audience, and so your work's coming up. So we've also been looking at medical meanings with everyday words, so patient in medical uh, context versus patient in everyday contexts. And then in aviation, Jenny, I'm not sure where you are, but she's been talking to me about aviation language for a while now, and we've finally figured a few things out. One of the, uh, the, this example gives you an idea of the kinds of language that's being used in this space. And the reason why Jenny wanted to do this work is because she's been trying to teach people um, to use aviation language, but the problem is there's no manual as to what to do in emergencies. Bit scary, eh? Okay, good. So part of what I wanted to do as well tonight is to talk about vocabulary knowledge. So I've already said it grows, right? So I've been looking as well at what happens with not just language learners, but what about their teachers? So how, how big are their vocabularies? And what sort of vocabulary do they have? Just recently carried out a study in Iceland. And to be completely honest, Icelandic teachers that we tested, their vocabulary size is off the hook. They are extraordinary. And they're extraordinary for several reasons. The first is they're all literature specialists, so they're doing it because they love it, right? And they live and they breathe and they get this language. So they're really excited by English. It's great to be in a room with people who are really keen on the job that they do. Uh, we, we've done, uh, if, if I was Icelandic, my name would be Doug, Doug's daughter. So I'll put that there for you, just so you know. And some recent work also in, in Indonesia. And one of the things we found out with the Indonesian teachers is that the closer they are to the training that they do to be an English teacher, the better their language skills. So the longer they're away from their training and out teaching English, their English language skills deteriorate. And that makes sense because they're not using the language beyond teaching. You know, open your books and do your thing. So we need to do more to try and help people in these spaces because that's not a comfortable place to be, right? 
Some of the other work we've done, I don't know if Ollie Balance is here, but we've worked at, for example, different resources that you need for doing different tasks in English. So what vocabulary do you need to understand TED Talks? Are TED Talks useful for learning English for academic purposes? So these kinds of questions. What about um, handouts that teachers give to students? And what we've found in this research is that if you've got a difficult textbook and you've got easy teacher talk, teacher handouts are in the middle. They really try and bridge difficult language and easy language. It's a really interesting space. But trying to get handouts off teachers is probably one of the most difficult things I've ever done. It's kind of like getting a PhD thesis off a student. Give me, give me, please, give me. <laughs> and we've also done some work on rap. And the vocabulary you need to actually understand rap you need a good sized vocabulary for that. So don't put down people who love rap music. Their vocabulary is probably going to be bigger than yours. OK. Just recently, we've done some work on the vocabulary that learners know, stay with me, and that teachers think that they think te learners know. Right? So do these things match up? So if the learners say, I know this, are the teachers going to think the same thing? And the answer is, mm, sometimes. And the people who grew up in the same education system are much better at knowing what learners will know. So the further you are from an education system, if you're teaching in an area, in a country, and you didn't grow up there in the same education system, you're not going to know it as well as the people who come in from overseas, for example. So this is just a bit of a taster of the sorts of work that we've been doing. I've also worked on how learners can learn vocabulary, because there's no point saying, well, you know, if you, if you listen to TED Talks, that's great, but this is the knowledge you need without actually trying to help them in some way. So we've looked, for example, at using a corpus, which is a body of text, and getting people to school up on how to use a corpus so that they can see language in use, real examples of language in use. And we've done some work with online resources. So Tui Bui, who's now down in Lincoln, this is her picture here, what she did is, is trained a whole lot of learners up on how to use these different kinds of tools. And what we've recently found is that even if they looked something up using a, a corpus tool, for example, if they looked something up online, actually they, now, they, they then start to use those terms in their writing. So it actually has an effect and has an impact on what they're doing, which is great to see because it's not just disappearing. The language doesn't just disappear. But it takes a lot of effort to do this. We've looked at uh, common textbook exercises and found out that they're not great. I'll move on. And uh, Hayley Thompson, uh, the reason why we're looking quite formal there is she had to provide evidence that she was here visiting me in, from Japan in New Zealand that we were having a meeting. So this is us having a meeting. So she, what she did is set up fluency workshops to try and help her Japanese learners become more fluent in English. And if you're interested in her work, she did a really fantastic job. And again, it just it takes research takes good ideas. So this is, these are all examples of very, very good ideas. OK. I want to tell you finally about vocabulary size and testing people's vocabulary size. The reason why I'm smiling is because this was a small idea that's just got bigger and bigger and bigger. So we've got work on first language speakers of English, and Paul very much drove this work, which is looking at the, the quality and the types of research that's gone into trying to find out how many words people know. And the problem is that in the literature, the estimates go from you know way over here to way over here, and it's, it's all a bit not random, but it's a bit tricky. Uh, we have a colleague in Wales who is currently developing a vocabulary size test based on five words, just to tell you about the sort of size and scale of these kinds of projects. So we took the vocabulary science test into New Zealand secondary schools and did a lot of work there. And if you, I think any, anybody, any researcher should do work in schools because teachers are amazing and students are amazing too. We had a great time in schools. We learned a lot. And we've done a lot of work on second language speakers of English and looking at bilingual tests, for example. Betsy Kero did work on that. And um, Irina Elgort has been leading the way in that space too. I wanted to tell you very briefly about one of the projects with the going into secondary schools, which was trying to, trying to find out what happens when students take one version of the test in a group and they take another version of the test as individuals sitting with a researcher. Right? So the purpose of the researcher being there is just to keep them going Keep them, you know, keep them motivated, keep them going in the task. And what we found is that for the highest scoring students, it didn't matter. If they had somebody sitting next to them or if they're in a big group, nobody cares. They scored well, right? 
But for the people who scored lowest in the test, if they had somebody sitting next to them, keeping them engaged, keeping them on task, they scored much better than if they sat in groups. Now, how do we test people in New Zealand secondary schools? How do we test people in New Zealand universities? We're in big groups. Imagine what's that, what, that, what, that's, what that's like for people who are going to score really poorly. So one of the things that I'd like us to do is to do more work with the lower, you know, people who are going to score poorly. We could just sit there. It's as simple as sitting next to them, just keeping them going, and they'll really do better. Okay. We've also been developing pseudo words for testing, because one of the problems when you test vocabulary is you might accidentally test them on a word that they already know, and you didn't mean to, to do that, right? And I'll talk a little bit about this in a minute. But um, these pseudo words that have been developed, we can now develop pseudo words or fake words in any language as long as there's a sufficient body of text in that language. The second thing is we can now develop pseudo words that look like technical words in English. And Seriously, you look at them and you think, well, yeah, that could be a word. And that's the whole point, right? Because you don't want people guessing is the key point about that. Okay. If you want to take the vocabulary science test, please do. It's, it's there for your entertainment. Oh. So just to give you an idea of how Paul's work has, has really um, helped us in this way. So on the left-hand side, you've got high-frequency words in the first and second thousand words of English. On the far right, you've got words that are in 7,000, 8,000. So as you go along, you can see that they, you get words that get, they're, they're not as frequent as the words in the 1 to 2,000. Does that make sense? So he is going to be more frequent than ploy, for example. Okay. So one of the tricks with this test is to sample. And we've got John Reed is an expert in testing, and he, he'll, be, he'll have a bit to say about this test as well. It's great to have you here, John. So here we go. We're going further down the frequency um, ladder through to words at 15,000, 16,000. So I'm hopeful that at this point you're starting to say, yeah, OK, there are words that I recognize here, but I wouldn't necessarily use them. And then the ones that everybody really wants to see <laughs> are these. I'm not too sure what a winter is, but I'm assuming it's a noun. Be a very odd verb. So one of the joys about doing this research has been talking with test takers after they've taken the test. So it's a multi, what is it? Multiple choice test, right? So here's a quote from somebody, a first language speaker who took the test and it's in the early days. And she said, yeah, this feels like Things are getting triggered way down deep in your memory. Deep in your memory gland, she said. It's really hard not to say memory gland at that point. <laughs> deep in your memory gland. It's like looking for something at the bottom of your handbag. <laughs> and then somebody else who was a second language speaker who may be in this room said, I was saying, so how did you choose these words? He said, yeah, roller king. Mm, no. But it sounded like rock and roll, so I chose the last one. Spot on. Gobbit, he said. Sounds disgusting. I chose it. It's spot on. And it, the reason why we talk about the slumdog millionaire effect, and this is something Paul talks about regularly with vocabulary size, is you never know what people will know. It's, a, it's amazing what happens with people's vocabulary size and knowledge. So um, in Slumdog Millionaire, or in the, in the book Q&A, the, a man's answering quiz questions based on what's happened to him throughout his life. And vocabulary size testing is very much like that too. And if you sit and say to somebody, so how did you learn that word? It's amazing what people remember about the vocabulary that they learned. Who at the time, and I've often talked with learners, and they'll say, you taught me that word. And I think, oh, don't I? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Is that me? Okay, all right. So if I reflect on the vocabulary science testing research, um, we've found that just like noses and ears, as you get older, your vocabulary grows. That's the, that's the good news. Um, I've learnt that people who think they have a large vocabulary will come and take a test. But what that means is people who don't think they have a large vocabulary will not come and take a test. I've learnt that when you set up a research project for first year students that you should probably specify how old they are. The first person through the door was in her 40s. So that means you can't really compare, right? It makes it very difficult. Um, I've learned that you are what you read. So Paul was interviewing a student. He scored really well on the vocabulary science test. He was in a New Zealand secondary school. And Paul said, so you're reading much? He said, yeah, mostly quantum physics, just at the moment. People are amazing. 
And I learned through Julie, by the way, who's here tonight, about what happens when people play MMORPG games. Their vocabulary sizes are astronomical. And unfortunately, language learners are not very, not, language teachers are not very happy about that. So what happens with these massive online role-playing games is there's high pressure, there's a lot of interaction, there's a lot of language. You have to use the language to play and to work with other people to achieve goals and do those things. So actually, people's vocabulary size is really amazing. And I, I talked with a group of Malaysian students and said, you guys, I'm really impressed with your vocabulary science. What's the secret? And they all did this. And I thought, oh, this isn't going to be good. And they started looking at their feet. <laughs> so, do I keep asking the question? I thought, no, 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 it's okay. You, you can tell me, what is it? And they said, oh, we play online role-playing games. And we know that this is good for us because we know that we know words that our classmates don't. And Julie, when she interviewed people, Somebody said, look, in my language class, I can look away, but when I'm playing these games, I can't look away from the screen. So they're so engaging. Okay. So you might have noticed a couple of things about this work. One is that there's a strong focus on teaching and learning. There's a commitment to being of this place, and I remember the moment where I thought, I'm just going to start doing research in New Zealand because this is where I... This is me, this is who I am, this is where I come from. So I've moved definitely to be doing that work. And it, this work has also gone beyond these shores. And it's highly collaborative with undergraduate students, postgraduate students, colleagues, with people overseas, people here in New Zealand. So I have a very privileged time in my job, and I know that, and I appreciate it. So it's time to sail in new directions. And I know there might be people in the room thinking this. <laughs> You can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. So I wanted to talk about the Language and Trades Education Project, or LATTE Project, and apparently that's my nickname for it. I never knew that, but it's a good one. Okay. So when I think about this project, I think about our dad, Doug, who used to say, when you bite off more than you can chew, chew like buggery. <laughs> he was right. <laughs> and... What you need to know is that statements like that from Dad were often followed by another one by our lovely mother, Bev, who used to say, your father thinks he's funny. <laughs> <laughs> and she was right. <laughs> he was funny. <laughs> so the, the Latte Project um, was based in... Uh, so it was across Welltech, which is the local polytechnic, Victoria University of Wellington, and sponsored also by Ako Aotearoa. And what we were trying to do was to describe trades language and to support the learning of trades language. And we quite honestly thought, yeah, that's doable. We'll give that a, sh we'll give that a shot, we'll give it a nudge, see where we get to. So why would you care? So first of all, this, this, there's a strong... Um, connection between language and identity. So in order to be part of a group, you need to speak the language of the group. And for, for builders, this means, for example, being able to follow explanations, being able to talk to people, talk through key concepts and use technical terms correctly. It's really key that you do that. So it's not, it's not just academic language that this is for. It's also true in trades language. And as you grow your vocabulary knowledge in a field, it, it, it's also you're developing your expertise, right? And here's one of the Welltech carpentry tutors, and he said, builders have their own sort of language. I try and get the guys, everybody's a guy, doesn't matter, everybody's a guy, to talk to me in that sort of language. So it's all about the size of the nails, the size of the timber, the grade of the timber, the treatment of the timber. So, we, you know, if you've grown up in a family like ours, you'd know a little bit about that, right? So you know, um, but you might not know as much as other people do. So one of the challenges for me was I knew a little bit about trades language, but actually it's a lot more complex. And it called, a, called for a lot of work. Bless you. So what about the trades learners? What did they think? And here's Kane, one of the second-year automotive electric students, and he said there's no other name for a transistor. And he doesn't mean radio. There's no other name for a transistor. So you need to know the exact name, or you'll be saying that switchy thing, <laughs> which is not cool. You know, this is not what you do. And... Um, the, you might think the vocabulary is familiar, but is it really? So do you know how to use this in context? So you only get one shot before you slip. doesn't sound good. If you slip and strip the head of the screw, I have no clue, but I, I know that it's not good right, if this happens. 
Now, early on in the project, one of the things that we found is that it was a bit difficult to publish the research. And the reason for that is because there were lots of questions coming back from the journals like this. What else is there in the field already? Nothing. That's, that's the point. So we couldn't talk about other research because there there's, there's nothing, right? So, OK, we needed to be clear about that. Where's your theoretical framework? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> How does language fit into the trades? How does it not? Okay, so we need to rethink the way that we're explaining this because clearly it's not making any sense. Is it this or this? Um, yep. Is it that? Yep. And that? Yeah, it's that too. <laughs> so it was a bit hard to find our space, I think, to start with. One of the things we did in the project was we, we tried to collect text that students read and the text that students write as well. And it was tricky. So you ask the question, what do they read? So they get, they get pedagogical texts and legal texts, all kinds of things to read. So what we ended up with was what the teachers gave the students to read. We just wanted that, OK? And it turns out it was a lot more complex than we thought, uh, gathering these kinds of texts, but we got there. And then the question was, what do they write? Well, the answer is actually one of the well-tech carpentry tutors said, well, I joined the trades to use my hands and not for writing, if you know what I mean. So the answer was, not much. Uh, we ended up collecting builders' diaries, which was good because we, you know, because um, you can't say, oh, we did this big study, but they don't write anything. So just, you know, this bit over here is more important. We also collected tutor talk. And this was an unexpected pleasure for several ways. So we mic'd up tutors, because otherwise you'd end up chasing them around all day, saying, can you please put this on? So we had to do a lot of remembering to turn the recorder on and then remembering to turn it off. Sometimes there were just long periods of silence because something had happened and we didn't know what, or students were doing something. This was the noisiest project I've ever been involved in. So when, on the good days, when people were out on building sites, right? They're carpenters and they're plumbers, so they're building things. It's astonishingly noisy and it's very difficult to, to hear in order to tra transcribe this work. And then when it was raining, everybody was inside in theory classes and you knew that everybody hated being in theory classes. The tutors and the students hated being in theory classes. So really this was, we took what we got, I have to say. And another thing that people often said was, um, oh, you needed to be more rigorous about making sure you had balances between this and this and this. And it's like, have you ever tried to collect spoken data? You know, have a bit of sympathy here, folks. So the joys of transcribing, what we found with transcription is that we moved, it's, this is classroom language in a way, so you move from giving instructions and greeting people and doing things straight into really highly technical language. So here's an example of a tutor saying, okay guys, as I expressed yesterday, as part of this bracket, you probably don't even need to be here, cool, you'll have to replace a core plug on your cylinder head. It's all going on all at once. So in order to transcribe this, we needed people who actually understood what they were hearing, and then we needed to go back to the tutors to say, we think you said this, is, do you think you said this? And can you listen for us? Because it's not easy for us to pick up this language. One of the struggles that we've had just recently, when we've followed up to do a, uh, on a project of trying to find out what people know about high frequency technical words, is that uh, this vocabulary, so what happens is you can get a technical word on its own or it can be a technical word because it combines with another word to make a technical term. Does that make sense? So Jenny Drayton, who's here, um, was interviewing some of the trades tutors to find out if the work that we'd been doing was any good. And what they found was that we were choosing the wrong pictures to put into a test because we had the wrong trade and the wrong thing, if that makes sense, right? So here he is saying, here's one of the tutors saying, some of these things are transferable across, tra across trades. So a spanner is a spanner. That's fine. But a lot of things are trade specific, even if they do the same thing. So a spark plug and an ignition probe both do the same thing. They create a spark. They're made of similar materials, but they're completely different. So you can't test people with the same picture because they won't necessarily recognize it. Right? So that was really clear that actually where we'd started with the project that we didn't want to bother the tutors until we'd developed something, that was wrong. What we should have done is gone to the tutors straight away and then we wouldn't have had that particular problem. Now one of the things about this project is you get to find out more about the nature of your own teaching when you find out what other teachers do in class. So 
Teaching trades doesn't look like teaching TESOL, teaching English to speakers of other languages. So here's a tutor, and he's setting things up, and he's saying, okay, what do we know? So if I hit this in, what's going to happen? So it's all here and now. So the, the, the students are listening, it's really intense, they're not writing anything down, they have to follow everything that's happening. And every teacher in this room will have experienced this moment at some point. So what's going to happen if I hit it straight in? It's going to cone in. Am I going to be able to get it out? No. So what do I want to do? Twist it. I'm going to hit one side. What am I going to hit? Is it the centre? Is it the outside? It's the outside. And then he says these fatal words. Watch it not work for me today after I've already done one. <laughs> Every teacher in the room goes, oh, I know what's going to come next. So there's hammering. That's not normal in an English language class. The tutor says, if I eye the screwdriver, and I'm thinking, what? If I eye the screwdriver, it does work better. Well, that's good news. Then you've got to check, right? What does that actually mean? And then he said, so he obviously goes over to start doing another one, and he goes, twist it out, and it comes out. Yep, good, now it's in there. It should have come out. <laughs> and then he says, do you know, it's a lot easier to do this on Friday when I did this before. <laughs> so I have a lot, a lot of um, empathy for this kind of event in a language class, but I don't think I would have ever said a word like this. I've been reassured that that word's been heard in this room before. <laughs> Possibly not during an inaugural lecture. Um, something else that came up was, uh, the, was the joy of hearing teachers teach and seeing, uh, listening to how they work through things and, and get learners involved. So here I have an automotive technology tutor and what they're doing is working through a fault analysis. So the student comes up to the front of the room and they talk it through and everybody else in the room is listening and watching, right? And there is a significance of the pie. The automotive technology word list, which is something that we developed as part of the project, the, key, the words are all highlighted there for you. So the tutor starts talking it through. So you can see there the current flow path, that our switches and regulator are up. The current flow goes through a warning light and the switch on the right side and then down to ground, but ground doesn't mean ground, right? So there's current flow through our ignition switch, top contacts through the rotor and down to ground, so we've got a problem. And then he sets up the problem. So if we stood here with our key on, engine off, and went to the shop and got a pie, came back, ate the pie, what's most likely to occur? I've got brothers going, I know. It's going to burn out. What's it going to burn out? It's going to burn out. It's going to burn out the rotor. Cool. So I, I really enjoyed this project because it, it stopped me in my tracks about what teachers do and how we work with language and how we've got all of this good things going on. So I learned a lot about vocabulary and trades education. I learned that... One word, is one word in three is technical and written trades text. And if you've done most of your learning through listening, one word in ten is technical and spoken trades text. In other words, the written language is far more technical than the spoken language. Most people are learning through the spoken language, so no wonder the written text can be highly problematic. I learned that if you ask tutors who teach first-year students versus tutors who teach second-year students about technical vocabulary, they do not agree, and we should not expect that. I've had a lot of pushback from academic uh, publishers of journal articles saying, but there's no agreement between these people about what's technical. And I have to say, that's the point. I know now that there are many EFL Englishes for foreign language teachers who come to conferences and come to talks like mine and come up afterwards and say, thank God somebody's doing some work in this space because we have no idea what we're doing. And there are many more of those people than those who are required to teach English for dog grooming, which is true. Uh, we're now, we've been working on testing vocabulary knowledge of words like line, as in line, a wall, and carpentry. Uh, and drive an automotive technology. So there's more work going on in this space, and if COVID hadn't happened, we would have been to Tonga and back several times by now. So I want to finish up by talking about uh, one more time when I've sailed in a different direction and learnt things that I didn't think I'd ever learn about myself. And I want to talk about a project where we took the uh, technical word list from the Latte project in four trades, and we use a research methodology called Talanoa. So what I've found out about myself is that I am a very Pākehā, Pākehā, so I want to talk about this here today. So Talanoa draws on an indigenous Polynesian worldview. So this research, and there'll be people in the room who know about this, it's conversation and context-based, and it's really about the mutual relationship. It's about trust and connection and face-to-face -face communication between researchers and participants. And to me, it sings of whakawhanaunatanga, so that's establishing relationships and getting to know each other. Now, 
I'm the baby of seven. I come from a small village. I thought I knew a little bit about establishing relationships and doing things with people. It turns out that I needed to learn a lot, and I'm glad that I have. So an, an important part of this research was this idea of um, developing a kakala, so a garland. And that's, so therefore, the, for the research, this is a metaphor. So you do your tolly, where you're selecting your leaves and your flowers, and then you weave, that's the tui part, and then you, you, you create the kakala, you create the research, and then you give it away. You give it back to the, to the, um, to the wearer. And that's a signal of love and reciprocity. So in this project, we had our technical word lists in English. We wanted them in Tongan. So we used the research that we'd already done. And then we needed to do some translation work, and we had trades experts who needed to be speakers of Tongan and experts in their trades here in Wellington. And we also engaged um, education experts in Tonga to do this work as well with us, because it's no point doing something if people aren't going to use it. Right? We had interesting research meetings. So Kiko, who was our, our colleague in this space, Kiko used to come in and he'd say, G'day, and I'd say, G'day, and I'd say, how's your research going? And he'd say, yep, we all had dinner last night together. And I'd go, yep, good. Tell me about the research, pro how are you doing with the transfer? He's like, yeah, no, but we had dinner last night. Like, okay, good. Week three, Kiko, g'day, how are you getting on? How's the research happening? He said, yeah, we were all at church on Sunday. Good. It took me to week eight to realise that what I needed to do was to say, Kiko, good to see you. Let's go and have lunch and talk about everything else but not the research project. Because you don't know me very well, I don't know you very well, so if there's no trust here, what are we doing? So I hope I got there in the end, but he did say to me in week 11, I think you're learning something. <laughs> So as part of the tui and the, the weaving that we did, we found, for example, that there are words, technical words that have been Tonganized, so you don't have to speak Tongan to recognize some of those words. We found that there were words that have a one-on-one -on -one technical translation, which is fabulous news if you're a language teacher because it means people have got it already, they just need the English word. Or if you're learning the Tongan, you've got it in English, all you need is the Tongan word, you've understand, understood the concept. We found words which have multiple words in English, but there's one word in Tongan, and that's not a deficit thing, that's just part of understanding that there are different ways of expressing something. And for example, we use three words in English where one word in Tongan will do the work. And we found technical words that need a full translation. So in effluent, if you put it into Tongan, has a full translation there, and if it's translated back into English, you get dirty water drain out. Okay, makes sense, right? Now, when it came to giving this research back, this is the first time I've ever worked in a research project where the first thing that was talked about was churches. So here's Kiko. Bernie, this is Kiko and the Booklets. <laughs> we thought that that would be a name of a really good band. So, so we had, and, and, and Kiko was very clear, what we need is paper-based book. Nobody's looking online in this community. This is not the space. We need to publish, if you're going to publish something, it needs to be something that they can hold and is theirs. Again, we needed all of these networks. So normally in my research, I go to conferences and I talk to people. I don't, I'm not in churches talking to people very often. And I'm certainly not talking about trades-based research in them if I am. We needed a lot of time and we needed collaboration and family time. And for me to understand that there will be feedback. For example, why didn't you do this in Te Reo Māori? Why didn't you do this in Samoan? These are all very good questions. And we've also had people adding to the list. So, you know, we made these lists in principled ways, and they decided that actually, no, I'm adding to it. And to be honest, I'm happy about that. I don't care. They're using them. I, I think that's great. And giving talks like this is also part of that, giving back to the community. So I'd really like to thank Kiko. He introduces himself as the summer scholar. It's a bit like me never, never leaving school. He always says, I'm the summer scholar, because even in 2021, we were still doing work together on this work. So in moving outside my comfort zones, I've learned a lot about my own cultural background, not as a negative way, but understanding that it has a major effect on the work that I do and how I work with other people. I've learned that learning about research in other contexts actually means a lot to me and to other people as well. I hadn't realized the emotional connection that I would make. And I've also learned to talk more directly about my research. And Maria is the one who pointed out to me that I'm constantly talking about other people's research. Why don't I ever talk about my own? 
Um, and Janet Holmes made the same point. I think that there are implications more generally about what happens when you go into schools and what happens when you go into the community to do more work in those spaces and giving back. And what I really want to say is there's just so much more to do and learn. I'm, I'm so excited about this work. Now, you've been very kind and you've been with me all of this time, and I have to say that I know that I think when I talk about applied linguistics, I look like this. <laughs> but I'm totally aware that probably, <laughs> probably, I look a lot more like that. So it's, it's an honour to be a professor, and it's an honour to be a professor who looks like this <laughs> as well, as much as anything else. So kia ora tato. thank you so much for your attention tonight. Thank you so much for being here, and I'd like to hand over now to Simon. It's your job now. <laughs> thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa, nā mihi nui ki a koutou koatai, mai nei i tēnē pō ki te whakarongo ki te kōrero wahapu o Ahorangi. Avril Cox had ko Simon Mackenzie tāku ingoa ko uh, o hōte amo o te wāhanga aranui. I'm Simon Mackenzie. I am uh, a professor of criminology in the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, and I'm the acting dean at the moment, and so I get the great pleasure and privilege of proposing on behalf of all of us a vote of thanks to Professor Avril Coxhead for her inaugural lecture as Professor in Applied Linguistics at Te Herenga Walker. Um, Avril is famous for bringing the laughs and this is how somebody put it to me uh, fairly recently. They said she makes everybody relax and she brings the laughs and I think she might have been having a bit of a laugh at our expense tonight because I did not recognize one single word in that final column <laughs> of the vocabulary test. No. Never mind Wintel. <laughs> Squinny. Squinny? Come on. Um, I think we need to look a bit more closely into this. In fact, I did look a bit more closely into this. I wrote these two down. Squinny and Wintel. I've got a bit here that says, note to self, red lines from Microsoft spell checker under Squinny and Wintel. Even the computer does not think these are words. Uh, it takes a very smart person to take people back to school in a room like this and to do it in such a nice and funny way is a rare skill indeed. I think we'll start a challenge in the faculty office to see if we can use each of those words in our email correspondence with staff over the coming month. Further note to self, just Google Squinny turns out it is real. It means whinging person. <laughs> Idea for next faculty email. <laughs> Pay freeze imminent. Don't be a squinny about it. Um, one of the things that you realize quite early on as a university lecturer is that if you want to uh, teach people, you need to grab them, you need to engage them, and you need to, uh, to get their emotional, their mental attention. And uh, even if you get them, then you can teach them. Uh, but if you, if you don't got them, then uh, it's going to be an uphill struggle. Uh, and I'm sure we've all been there. And I think Averill's just given us a master class tonight in how to do that, how to get people, how to, how to um, I feel like I've been got. Um, what a joy to be a part of it, to be swept along like that. And the result is that she's educated us. I know about squinnies and I know about wintels and lattes uh, and a whole lot else besides. Uh, I was digging around in Averill's back catalogue of papers and I came across um, the very article that she talked about in relation to the aviation study, which is called Plain Language or Anything But, in the Journal of Aviation slash Aerospace Education and Research. And at the time I thought, well, that's a pretty cool journal for um, a linguist to be in, unexpected, because surely aviation slash aerospace research is like how to build a jet engine, or can I put 91 in instead of 95 <laughs> if you're a cheapo like me? Will it still work? But no, um, in the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, we get into all of the interesting academic nooks and crannies, and aerospace linguistics is one of them. So. I'm going to do that thing now where I try and summarize somebody else's paper and I won't get it right, but, but I can tell you at least what I took from it. Um, there are two schools of thought in relation to what you should do in an emergency in 
should we call it a linguistic emergency, right? So, um, so there's, there's people in the aircraft control towers and there's the people flying the planes and they're trying to speak to each other. Uh, there's one school of thought, and Averill and our colleague were interviewing the people in the, in the towers. There's one school of thought which is we should stick to the technical jargon because this is an emergency. So this is no time to be departing from the agreed language that we speak to each other. The other school of thought is that um, in emergencies, unforeseen things happen. And the jargon can't really be expected to expand into all of these unforeseen situations. And so you should resort to plain English. You should speak in a very sort of uh, straightforward way. And then, like, like everything else, there's, there's people in the middle um, who think you should sort of do a, a bit of one and a bit of the other. Um, reading this paper had two effects on me. Firstly, since I've always been a bit of a nervous flyer anyway, it gave me one more thing to worry about because <laughs> What I took from it, and it's just been confirmed, I think, by this lecture, is that there is, in practice, no working agreement on how people should speak to each other in an aviation emergency. So not only now do you have to be sitting there listening to the engine noises for clunks and bunks and wondering why the guy next to you is sneezing uh, and has he got his mask on or not, you've got to be thinking, what's the pilot going to be saying to the control tower if this all goes bad? And, and will they understand each other? So at, at moments like that, I just... Uh, have a few deep breaths into a paper bag, and thank goodness that Averill's on the case. Um, that, that was, the, that was the, the panic attack was the first effect. The second effect the paper had on me was that kind of light bulb moment that you have when you read really good academic research and it just clicks and everything becomes clear and you suddenly see the, the importance of it, which often, as in this case, um, comes in shining a spotlight on and calling into question things that have been taken for granted. Uh, we often assume that people know how to talk to each other, more or less, probably more rather than less if it's a case of professionals and, and technical jargon. But of course we should know better. You look anywhere in society or in language and you see people just getting along, playing with rules, um, modifying them in practice, interpreting the world and making it at the same time. Um, once you've identified that, even in specialist areas like aviation or the trades or whatever, uh, once you see that cultures of language exist, then the important task becomes mapping their particular patterns, and um, that's important because through that understanding, you can help people become better communicators, and you can, you can help people better understand the communications of others. So I get it now, Averill, you've educated me, you've educated all of us tonight, how clever to do it in the, uh, the format of a fun public lecture, language explaining language, words about words. Um, in terms of her international reputation, Averill is a globally renowned expert in applied linguistics. She's also got a fearsome and very widely recognized reputation as a fantastic teacher. I didn't think I'd still be learning words at this point in my life, but I now realize not only was I wrong, I have some small insight into how massively wrong I was uh, and how much there still is to do, which is both invigorating and daunting but then uh, lifelong learning is a journey, isn't it? And uh, very glad that we're all at VUW on that journey with you, Averill. I'm sure I've called you Averill at least, I have, haven't I? <laughs> Honestly, Avril, I've, I've known a lot of Averills in my life and um, I, my brain knows that it's Averill, but my face thinks something different. And I hear myself saying it and I think, oh, geez, that's, why, don't, why can't you get it right? And, it, and, it, and the irony is not lost on me that this is A, a linguistics lecture, and B, <laughs> here's someone who's dedicated their working life to helping people get words right and to use them correctly. And the one word that I can't consistently get right. Uh, yeah. Um, on behalf of your university and the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, a warm and belated and COVID-delayed uh, welcome to our professoriate. On behalf of all of your colleagues and your friends uh, and your family here tonight, we are uh, delighted and honored to have you uh, as one of our scholarly thought leaders in the community. Um, now, in a minute, I'm going to invite everybody to wintle over to the common room. <laughs> Uh, which is through those doors there that you can see if you take a squinny over your shoulder. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's not right. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, come and join us for a drink. The lattes tonight may be intellectual ones, but the beer and wine are very real. Nami uh, Nui Kia Koe Averill, let's give a big hand and thanks and congratulations to Professor Averill Cochran.